Freddie, we're so close. How are you feeling? Are you still alive? I'm ready to be done. You're I'm ready looking to be forward done. to Friday morning. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking forward to people walking up Downing Street. I don't really care who it is at this point. I just want it. I want someone to do that. So yeah, we're, we're nearly there. Nearly there. Um, well, the big story of today is reform, really, because a second reform candidate has suspended her campaign yeah. and defected to the Conservatives because she says the vast majority, that's a quote, of her fellow candidates are racist, misogynistic and bigoted. Tell us what you really think, Georgie David. Uh, she was the reform candidate for West Ham and Beckton. What do you make of this? You've been following reform. You've been following the, the campaign. What does it mean that reform candidates are in free fall? OK, so I think it's bad for two reasons. First of all, it's bad for Nigel Farage. It shows that he's got no control over his party. He'll blame the fact that Rishi Sunak sprung this election on him, uh, I think, which is a, a pretty poor excuse because, uh, as we've discussed before, that you have to ask and question why these people are going to reform in the first place. And then the second reason is, I think, about how much the public will take notice. We had a, a YouGov poll out, I think it was yesterday or the day before, and it essentially said that 9% of people have heard about this story. So it's up there. It's up there with uh, the betting scandal. The story of reform uh, activists being yeah. uh, captured by and candidates. Channel 4 the, the, and candidates. Yeah, the general racism, yeah. row, and, and, and candidates saying uh, obnoxious things. So it is getting some cuts through now and it, I think that's a consequence of the fact that it's been about two, three weeks that we've had these stories. I think reform are, are smarting from it. I think uh, Nigel Farage and the team around him haven't shut it down quickly enough. They've sometimes waited days to suspend people. Even if they do suspend people, it takes days for them to do so. Or they've sort of hedged it. There's been a few occasions where Nigel Farage has been uh, pressed with a camera and asked, what, what do you think if it goes? He, you know, he sort of just shrugs it off or says it's it's really bad, but that's all. You know, I think there's a, there was a lack of condemnation and, and swift decision making from the top of reform and, and they're, uh, they're bearing the cost of that now. The key question is how they go forwards um, and also what constitutes their party after the election. So if, if they are going to get any seats, it's probably only going to be two or three. Um, Nigel Farage in Clacton, uh, Lee Anderson in, in Ashfield. So they're probably more um, well-known figures, so it might not be as concerning after the election, but I think there's no question that it's been very bad for their, their polling in the past two weeks of the campaign. So uh, Georgia David has said that she says, I am in no doubt that the party and its senior leadership are not racist. However, as the vast majority of candidates are indeed racist, misogynistic and bigoted, I do not wish to be directly associated with people who hold such views that are so vastly opposed to my own and what I stand for. I've also been significantly frustrated and dismayed by the failure of the Reform Party's leadership to tackle this issue in any meaningful way and their attempts to instead try to brush it under the carpet or cry foul play. I think it's interesting the range of tactics that Nigel Farage has taken as these various stories around candidates uh, have broken. Sometimes he has uh, said it was a fault of the betting company yeah. um, and, and appeared to condemn the, the individuals and basically said it's not his fault. Sometimes he's accused the media of blowing it all out of proportion. Um, when it was put to him that uh, almost a, a tenth of reforms candidates are friends on Facebook yeah, with... 41 of them. 41 of them uh, with uh, Gary Rikes, who is a former organiser for the, the BNP and is, is leader of literally a, a fascist group. His response was, not my fault they didn't all go to Eton, like those two things are kind of equivalent. Uh, he also has accused Channel 4 of... All that working class people are in some way inherently more fascistic than others. Yes, everyone who didn't go to Eton is working class and everyone who is working class has fascist yeah. sympathies, I think was the argument there. But he also accused Channel 4 of uh, hiring an actor and said that the comments made by the canvasser were staged, essentially. The canvasser one I have a tiny bit more sympathy with him for because I think vetting your candidates is one thing vetting your activists yeah. is another and I'm pretty sure you could find people with quite fringe views canvassing for any one of the parties um, but the fact that he came down immediately with it's all been staged it's, 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 it's a stitch up kind of isn't really taking responsibility and isn't answering the question which you you raised um, and which Hannah Barnes raised in her in her column this week that why is it that these individuals feel attracted to reform? Why do people with these views, conspiracy theorists, very misogynistic mm. views, very racist views, why do they feel that they will be welcomed in this political movement? And what does it say about Farage that, that that's the impression that they're getting of it? Yeah, I mean, Farage would say there is no 
proper party to the right of him. That's why he attracts everyone to the right of him because you know he will say he got rid of the BNP in the late two uh, thousands. I think the key thing is that this is completely unsustainable uh, if they do want to control politics in the next five years, which is Nigel Farage has been very clear that that's the objective, then he's going to have to deal with it very swiftly and he hasn't done so so far. Here's a thought experiment. I think Farage, I think, will will, will win the seat in Clacton. I think it would be better for Farage if he was the only reform candidate who became an MP rather than getting two or three or four because I think there is such a, a diversity of strength of feeling, shall we say, among reform candidates that Farage isn't going to want to have to answer those questions about what others in his party think. And also, it's not really a party in the traditional sense. It's a limited company, which which he kind of owns. And I I wonder if it would actually be better for his personal ambitions to be the only MP to be able to make the case that the UK's voting system is unfair to Mm. to smaller parties because here's our vote share, here's our number of MPs, but not have to share the limelight with anyone. I just also, I wonder about Lee Anderson and Nigel Farage, like how long would it take for that coalition to to split off? Yeah, I mean, I think Farage famously doesn't work that well with people who are trying to steal his limelight. Doesn't play nicely with others. No, he he wants to be the, the key leader. I think, just to counter your point, Rachel, it's much more important for them to get a, a broad base of candidates, of MPs, of councillors, of activists, or whatever it might be. And as soon as you get people on the payroll, um, as they did, as UKIP did with uh, MEPs so successfully, it gives you that paid basis that uh, allows you to sustain a party campaign without donations or whatever it might be. So, yeah, but I think you're, it, is, it could be a source of tension going forward. But reform can't get any MEPs because we don't have MEPs no, exactly. anymore so because, because, we left, get, because we left the European Union. Because we get some MPs then. Moving swiftly on. Right, Freddie, do you ever work past 6pm? Every day. Every day, <laughs> <laughs> Keir Starmer uh, has caused a little bit of a, a last minute storm in a teacup row, depending on how you how you see it. He said on Virgin Radio on Monday, uh, he talked about his, his, his work-life balance. He said, we've had a strategy in place and we'll try to keep it, which is to carve out pr- really protected time for the kids. So on a Friday, I've been doing this for years, yeah. I will not work on a work-related thing after six o'clock, pretty much come what may. There are a few exceptions, but that's what we do. This has caused absolute meltdown in, in conservative circles. He's been called so sleepy. People have been making all kinds of, of comments about well, what happens if nuclear war is uh, threatened at 6.05 on a, on a Friday. It's been extrapolated to him saying that he won't work past 6pm any day of the week rather than just Friday. Part-time prime minister. Part-time prime minister. You know, is he looking a bit tired? You know, bringing out the difference in age and energy levels of Sunak mm. and, and Starmer. Does any of this matter is that um, is it fair it, it's not fair at all no i don't think that keir starmer saying that he wants to spend some time with the kids on a friday how dare he make, makes him any worse as a prime minister it probably actually makes him more relatable to people um and i don't you know he says it helps him work which is completely believable so i don't see any problem with that i think it's really interesting that the tory party thing is wise for them in the last two days of this uh undignified campaign to go after the argument they they started with six weeks ago which was a sleepy care. Now they're trying to do the the sleepy Joe Biden attack on Keir Starmer, aren't yeah, which, they? Which which is completely different. I mean, Biden is twenty discussed, years older than Starmer. As we discussed, Joe Biden is really struggling. We saw in the debate last week. Keir Starmer is in no way uh, equal to that. We also know that both Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer are quite diligent people. They both work extremely hard. So I don't think that will be a problem. I just find it remarkable that the Conservatives want to spend these final two days talking about Keir Starmer's Friday evenings rather than what's in their manifesto, rather than their, their plans for to, to grow the economy, their tax cuts, their, their support for Northern Powerhouse Rail, whatever it might be, they just don't want to talk about it. They would rather concede the fact that Keir Starmer is probably going to be Prime Minister on Friday and what he's going to do at six o'clock that day. I just, I just find it a bit facile. I find it quite odd on a couple of levels, one of which is that Rishi Sunak was asked uh, earlier on in the campaign... Yeah for one thing that he admired about Starmer mm. and he actually said you know, he makes time for his family uh, he, he values his family prioritises his family so that's one thing two is that um, the reason that Starmer has given in the past for Friday nights being special is his wife's family are Jewish and they're raising their children in a sort of dual faith household and I cannot imagine this kind of reaction if a candidate 
the Prime Minister had said that they tried to keep Sunday mornings free for church. Mm. So I think that the the religious aspect of this, I don't think that was intentional anti-Semitism on the part of the Conservatives, but it's not a great look. The other reason that I just don't see it working is that there are many criticisms you can make of Keir Starmer, yeah. that he's boring, that he flip-flops, that he won't tell you what he really thinks, uh, that he's not being honest with the public. Like All of that is genuine and sort of cuts through work shy, lazy. Mm. I just don't see that as being a criticism that really lands. Do no, you? everything that you hear about Keir Starmer, his time as a lawyer, his time at university, what his friends have said, what the biographies say, is that he's a workaholic. So I don't think that'll be an issue. We've got to remember as well that you know, David Cameron was famously relaxed as as Prime Minister. Churchill used to spend all morning in bed, but then you had the Churchill other side. Churchill wrote his papers in the bath. There you go. And then you know, Margaret Thatcher would only get four hours sleep. So different Prime Ministers do it in different ways. And you haven't even mentioned Boris Johnson there. I didn't want to. No. Uh, <laughs> Joe Biden apparently is only being in public between 10 and 4 p.m. Uh, so that he's awake and alert uh, as much as possible. So I don't think this is going to be an issue. And as I said, I think it's extremely strange for the Tories to think that they're going to land some blows here, but they clearly do. So on that note, Rachel, they seem to have given up on the election, uh, in part, I think, because many of them have already turned their minds to what happens afterwards. You've written a great piece, uh, I think it was yesterday, uh, on what, what this shadow Tory leadership contest is looking like. Tell us about it. Who's running? Who's set up their websites? What's the priority? <laughs> Everyone is running and no one has set up a website. The fact that there are websites right. set up for uh, Swallow Braverman and Kemi Badenoch, you know, they, they have uh, distanced themselves from that and said it's nothing to do with us. Penny Morden has a website existing from mm. her leadership bid in 2022. Yeah, yeah uh, which she hasn't taken down. Um, it's like having a spare tyre in the back of the car, apparently. But yeah, this leadership race is kind of wide open because usually in a leadership contest, it comes down to the makeup of the parliamentary parties because MPs vote on the candidates until there are just two left and then those two go to the membership. This election, we don't even know who's going to have their seat uh, in order to stand. So Penny Morden with, with her website, she's looking at risk. Uh, if you look at you know some others that you would have considered really safe, like Sala Braverman's seat, not entirely safe. Kemi Badenoch's seat, quite safe. James Cleverly, depending on which polls you look at, possibly in danger. Robert Jenrick, possibly in danger. So we've got loads of contenders and we won't really get a sense of what the dynamics are shaping it until we know what the makeup of that party is. But we do know what the central kind of existential question framing that contest is going to be. Uh, and it's going to be, what do you do about Nigel Farage and the threat of reform? Do you need to move in a reform-friendly direction, welcome Nigel Farage back into the party? All of them, apart from Suella Braverman, have explicitly ruled that out and said we don't want him back in the party but depending on how well he does and reform do you can see that that is going to be a very active debate and even if you don't let him into the party do you take a stronger line on mm. immigration a stronger line on the culture wars sort of lower taxes try and frame your offering towards voters who abandoned the conservatives for reform or do you take the David Cameron approach and accept that elections generally are won from the centre and you know, you've lost the people to reform, but what about the ones you lost to the Lib Dems? What about the ones you lost to Labour? What about the ones who just didn't vote because they were too disgusted with everything that's going on? Is there a more moderate sort of winning formula of conservatism? And I'd say that all the people whose names are being thrown around kind of broadly fall into one of those two camps. James Cleverly has pretty much that he's not going to run. I think he probably will. Yeah. Um, he's in the sort of moderate camp, Penny Morden, obviously Tom Tugendhat. Uh, and then in the reform-friendly group, obviously Swella Braverman, although even people on the right of the party feel quite disillusioned with her. Robert Jenrick, uh, Preeti Patel, I think could make a phenomenal mm -hmm. comeback. She's very popular with the grassroots. Uh, and Kemi Badenoch, who's kind of trying to be both, trying to be like the sensible mm. right winger. Um, you had also, an interesting point in your piece about Kemi uh, Badenoch and the fact that some people see her as way too bullish and prickly and, and aggressive with the press. I mean, is, is you think that's a concern with, with Tory MPs? Yeah, I think it will be a concern because being leader of the opposition is really different to being a cabinet minister. Yeah. When you're an actual secretary of state or even a cabinet minister, the press kind of have to come to you. They like they, they are courting you for interviews. And Kemi Badenoch's never been in opposition. She has... Uh, 
always had the luxury of deciding who she chooses to talk to. She hasn't really had to build relationships with the press because they've all wanted to build relationships with her. When you're opposition leader, you're basically there going, hello, please notice us, please notice our policies, please like us, please pay attention because everyone's attention is going to be on Labour. And I don't, I've spoken to various people in the party who worry that she doesn't have that experience but also that understanding that it's a very different kind of job and they would suggest that maybe someone like James Cleverley, Penny Morden, even Preeti Patel have that understanding in a in a deeper way. Other people I've spoken to say look at the challenge that we're facing we need a real deep debate conversation um, a kind of almost intellectual academic challenge wow. of what is this party for what are we how do we rebuild what is conservatism for and you need somebody who's got the intellectual ability to take that on mm. and Kemi's name comes up higher and in more positive terms in that conversation than perhaps some of the others mm, okay and the other thing Rachel do you think Rishi's going to stay on uh, you know, Michael Howard S, because he did in 2005 uh, for six months and it allowed that, that leadership election to happen over a much longer period of time and it allowed Dave, David Cameron to come through through the middle and um, and beat David Davis. Do you think that's a possibility? And one cabinet minister said to me the other day that they think he will do that. What do you think? I think it would be better for the party if he did because I think yeah. having more time to have this conversation would be helpful for them and av- avoid a kind of knee-jerk, panicked reaction. But look at Rishi Sunak. Does he look like he's having fun? Does he look like he's enjoying being the leader in, in these circumstances? I think he's become numb. You I, think... I watched him on the, the news round this morning and he looked numb. He looked quite calm, actually. He looked like he blocked everything out and he was just going through the motions for the final few days. He'd, he'd given up, but he was there to sort of justify his position and, and say and speak whenever the interviewers let him speak. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was quite strange. It was definitely a change of tone. Ser- serenity uh, in acceptance. No, I think he's going to be off to California pretty much as, mm. as soon as as soon as he can. And there has been talk of, could they have a caretaker leader yeah. you know, in, in the interim? The problem is, I was speaking to, to somebody in the party about this, there aren't many caretaker kind of figures left. It seems as if there's so much anger towards the Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden for being one of the instigators of an early election that I'm not sure he'll be able to do it. I raised the prospect of David Davis as a caretaker mm. uh, and I was told David Davis thinks he's a player. So. <laughs> right, okay, well there you go. <laughs> you heard it here first. And obviously we're t- we've been talking about the challenge when they have sort of very few MPs, mm. somewhere between 50 and 150. They're also going to be really short of donations, short of volunteers, local associations, uh, just the kind of energy that you need to to revitalise a party. It's not just about the MPs, it's about the whole Conservative ecosystem. And we'll be taking a deeper look into the state of the Conservative Party tomorrow on the podcast with former Conservative MP and New Statesman columnist David Gorg.